Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ann Peter from the Pulitzer Center, and I'm glad you are joining us today as we consider cross-border migration and especially the situation of individuals seeking asylum during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also share stories of veterans who have served in the US military, but were deported even before this current situation. As we await more folks to join us, please let us know in the chat where you're listening from today. Our session is part of the Pulitzer Center's Focus on Justice series. We believe it is critical, especially at this moment in our history, to keep issues of justice at the forefront of our reporting and of our conversations. For those of, us, for those of you who have not joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization based in Washington, DC, supporting more than 170 reporting projects each year on global and local issues. Our website takes a look under uh, a range of reporting issues, which you can also find on our site, bringing together by themes, issues of racial justice, indigenous communities, migration and public health, among others. We've developed a strong university partnership with more than 30 universities, mainly in the US, and award reporting fellowships to their students each year. On the education front, K through 12, we reach thousands of students and educators via online session, professional development workshops, and when possible, class visits. We also organize public events and webinars, such as this one, our series, Focus on Justice. We have visitors today online from California, San Francisco, listening from San Salvador, Massachusetts, Harpen Springs, Florida. And thank you for joining us today. We have a few logistics just to keep in mind. All of our attendees are muted, but if you can't hear us at any point, please let us know via the chat. We'll also be recording this session to post online for others who could not join us today. We want you to go ahead and start as soon as you, something comes to mind, putting your questions in the Q&A. You'll find an icon on your screen and you can add your questions at any time during the remarks. We'll begin with our conversation with our guests and then start answering questions from the audience. If you would like to also tweet, please use the hashtag justicefocus. And one final logistical note, please remember to stay online once the session ends to participate in a brief survey. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Maria Inahosa is an award-winning journalist whose career spans nearly 30 years, reporting for PBS, CBS, WNBC, CNN, and NPR. As a reporter who was the first Latina in many newsrooms, she dreamed of a space where she could create independent multimedia journalism that explores and gives voice, gives a critical voice to the diverse American experience. So 10 years ago, she created Futura Media, an independent nonprofit organization based in New York City. She is the co-host of In the Thick, Futura Media's new political podcast, and also the anchor and executive producer of the PB of the Peabody award-winning show, Latina USA, distributed by NPR. She is the author of two books, and that is only part of her resume. Anna Catherine Brigida is a freelance journalist based in Nicaragua, who was reported on migration from the region from 2015. She was reported from nearly every part of the migrant trail, from Honduras to Southern Mexico to the US-Mexico border. Her reporting has appeared in a range of outlets, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, Time, Texas Monthly, among others. She has received reporting grants from the International Center for Journalists, International Women's Media Foundation, and Solutions Journalism Network. Her current reporting project, supported by the Pulitzer Center, is as part of a team from the Texas Observer. Maria Zamudio is an award-winning investigative journalist who is part of the Race, Class, and Communities team at WBEZ in Chicago. Prior to joining WBEZ, Maria worked for American Public Radio's investigative team, and she has also been an investigative reporter for the Mem Memphis Commercial Appeal and Chicago Reporter. In 2015, Maria was part of a team from NPR's Latina USA, 
receiving a Peabody National Award for coverage of Central American migrants. And her story in particular focused on the danger women faced while traveling toward the US. Her work has also appeared in the Associated Press, New York Times, and Telemundo, among others. We'll share links in the chat for our audience related to the reporting that all of these journalists have done for the Pulitzer Center in particular, so you can explore those issues and their work more broadly. So our short title is related to seeking asylum in a pandemic, but we'll be del delving into much more during our hour long time together. Maria Hinojosa, I wanted to ask you about your, some of your most recent reporting as you led a team from Latina USA on the increasing dire and confusing situation facing refugees seeking asylum in the US, the two part series, the moving border, the North and the South. In it, you talk about a wall, a policy wall rather than a physical wall. Can you go into more detail on what that has meant for those individuals, especially the asylum seekers? Yeah, it's great to be here. Hola, Maria. <laughs> Hola, <laughs> Caterine. Um, and hello, Anne, and to everybody who's watching wherever you are. Um, this is the benefit of a pandemic is that we get to see each other like this um, and you get to be in my bedroom. So there you have it. Um, this has been a particularly uh, challenging time to be reporting. And I remember the thing that got me to think about wanting to do this piece was when I got a phone call from a refugee who we've been following throughout and who ends up in our Moving Borders Part 2 section. His name is Josue, he's from Honduras. And at one point he had made yet another return back to Mexico and he was on the southern border of Tapachula, Mexico with Guatemala. <clears throat> and I simply said to him, Oyeme, Josue, ¿qué ves? Dije, cuéntame, dime lo que ves. Estás en la plaza, you're in the plaza right now. What do you see? Describe this for me. <clears throat> and he said, oh, I see so many Africans. I see so many Haitians. I see other people from other parts of the world and many, many, many Central Americans. And so that was an image that I needed to document and see for myself as a Mexican born woman who's been crossing in and out of Mexico my whole life. <clears throat> that led us to understand that what's happened between the Donald Trump administration and the administration, the progressive leftist administration of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador from Mexico, the president of Mexico, is that these two men have collaborated together through policy to create a policy wall where people like Josue get stuck in Tapachula. So remember how we would see and hear about them at the border and Donald Trump could talk about the masses of people trying to get in and break down that wall or fence or whatever. Those people are not there now because they're down at the border of Mexico and Guatemala. And this is happening with the collaboration um, completely from the Mexican government. I'll just end by saying that um, a as a Mexican woman <clears throat> who crossed, because I grew up in Chicago where Maria Inés is right now, and I crossed into Mexico every single year of my life, usually by car. And there was a very clear, distinct childhood memory of getting into the United States and feeling like, oh, immigration, they could take away our green cards at any moment. This is a kind of tense situation. <clears throat> These versus how we felt when we got into Mexico, where there were other concerns, something called La Mordida, you know, where you may have to pay off a cop to, you know, but, but there was not this notion of being stopped and asked for your papers in Mexico. That now happens in Mexico throughout the southern border, the northern border, and to me, to be able to document that, to be able to show it, to be able to put a face on that was really important because the, the politics of this country have always affected the region, and this is yet another way in which the politics of this country have affected not only Mexico, but the entire region. We're not here. <laughs> I apologize. I was trying to be quiet while you were talking. 
So my dog, whatever. So just as a follow-up before we, we go on to our other uh, journalists today, uh, in your reporting, you also talk about, and I think all of you know these numbers, uh, that President Trump, when he deployed those policies, it left more than 60,000 asylum seekers there, many of whom were children, um, as part of this mig migrant protection policy or the uh, Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, <clears throat> less than a dozen asylum seekers were allowed to enter the U.S. since late March, I believe. Can you give us a little bit more in terms of, these are numbers, but what is this in terms of the individual impact? And I know Anna Kat will also get into that as well as and Maria. <clears throat> so the image that I have, is the story that we told in part one of Moving Borders. And thank you again to the Pulitzer Center for supporting us because it was a very quick turnaround. We were kind of like, we need help now. And you guys were like, okay, we're gonna help you. So thank you so much back then when we could travel. So the image that I have right now is of um, <clears throat> Susie and Zoe. Um, so this is a mother and a daughter who left Honduras because they were being for the exact same story that Maria Ines Amudio reported on from four years ago, five years ago, um, the amount of corruption and insecurity for a woman, um, a small business, you know, somebody who was just trying to make sell, sell wares on the street. And so they left because their lives were at stake. When they end up um, in a shelter in Juarez, the little girl is sexually assaulted, we believe, in the middle of the night. She just wakes up naked one morning. Um, they are kidnapped <clears throat> from the street, taken from a bus stop. Um, they had to escape and run for their lives. And they are exactly the people who are waiting in the line to try to get to the case where maybe they can present their case. They're stuck. The last I heard from them is that their meetings have been postponed. They have no place to go. Um, sorry about that. They have no place to go. They have been offered shelter in a kind of difficult situation, but at least for now it looks like they're okay, but they're stuck. And so when we talk about these questions of policy, you know, and we used to be able to get into, well, there's this policy and then there's that policy and then there's this entry and then there's, the policy now is that it's shut down. And this is something that <clears throat> as journalists, we have to really think about how we report now on something that has been built up, not over one year or two years or even four years. The Obama administration, the George W. Bush administration, the Bill Clinton administration, the actually the best one recently was George, George H. W. Bush. Um, but even the Reagan administration in terms of Central American refugees, shut down. So this is where we're looking and we have to now deconstruct this because these are people who came to the United States because I don't know, they just heard somewhere, maybe in the history books, maybe in the blinking lights on the Statue of Liberty that says, come here, maybe because they have heard the history of their own countries and they know that people have come here when they are desperate. So they believed the same of come. And now they are stuck. And now Mexico, sadly, off oh, look at that. I'm getting the phone call from Josue right now. He's calling me. And I can't speak to him because I'm with you. He's calling me desperate because he ended up leaving Tapachula again and going back to Honduras because he was starving. And he's calling me. And as you know, as a journalist, there's nothing that I can do. I, I, I just have to listen to him in his desperation. So that's what it looks like. It looks like human beings who are desperate. And as a journalist who's been covering this, Jesus, they get into my heart. And that's why they call. Because as a journalist, we have to show a human connection to their stories. Otherwise, how dare we? How dare we ask them to take time to speak to us? We have to show this emotion because this is real. And that's why I think, I know Maria Ines, I have so much respect for her work, but that's why I think that journalists, like at least myself and Maria Ines, who I know her work much more so than you and I, Katerin, is that we allow ourselves to remain human. 
And that I think is a central conversation that we as journalists have to have. And I'm sorry I cry. Don't, don't apologize. Don't apologize because I think these are the stories, as we say, the numbers are numbers, but it's the individuals whose stories need to be told. And Anna Kat, I know you're looking more now currently along the border and really exposing the, the cracks in this already broken asylum system that Maria was talking about that's further endangering these vulnerable individuals. Um, what in terms are you seeing now, whether it's with your colleagues in Texas along the Guatemala border or in Guatemala and elsewhere in terms of the current situation for individuals, especially now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know you've also been doing some other reporting related to detention facilities here in the US. So fill us in on some of that. Thank you for having me. And, and first off, just thank you to Maria for, for sharing those experiences. You know, just building off of, of what Maria was saying, you know, these, immigrants and asylum seekers are in very desperate situations. And that was true even before the pandemic. So just to, to sort of start off with um, the project that I've been working on, that's the Pulitzer Center funded project with the Texas Observer. It's a collaboration between uh, four reporters. So um, Acacia Coronado, who was a fellow at the Texas Observer, uh, Emily Kinski, who is based in El Paso, and Morena Perez Joaquin, who's based in Guatemala. And uh, we've all covered immigration from different angles, different parts of uh, the migrant trail. And really the idea at the beginning of it was to show how these people in already vulnerable situations, how they were going to be affected by the pandemic and how, you know, if you are you know, you know, there's guidelines of, of following, uh, you know, social distancing and, and we, we know what the guidelines are, but how do you follow those guidelines when you're at a shelter, um, you know, in a Mexican border city, as we, as we talked about these 60,000 asylum seekers who are stuck in, in Mexican border cities under MPP, or how do you practice social distancing and keep yourself safe when you're in ICE detention, which for, for years activists have been saying that these uh, detention centers are, are public health, um, just you know, inviting a public health crisis because uh, they're just um, very horrible conditions if you talk to, to any, any immigrant who's spent any time there. Um, so that was sort of the, the general idea of what we wanted to to look into with our project. Um, and our first uh, part of the series focused on MPP program. So we followed um, that in a few different cities in, in cities along the Texas-Mexico border. So in El Paso, we followed um, a Cuban asylum seeker who I'll call D, who's stuck there, um, has gone through so much trauma in in a, a period of months, um, she was attacked in Mexico. Uh, she tried to have a second interview to then be allowed into the U.S. to wait for her, um, to wait uh, out her case while in the U.S., which was usually the policy um, before MPP was put in place, and uh, she was denied. That was in March, so she believes that that had to do with the pandemic. Um, because when she was in a, a, a CBP facility, she um, heard, overheard people talking and, and the officials talking. And at that point too, Trump was making uh, some announcements and policies, you know, now basically um, everybody who crosses, almost everyone who crosses the border um, is immediately expelled uh, either back to Mexico or to their home countries under another very restrictive um, Trump administration policy of, uh, that's been justified by the pandemic. So we wanted to, to share those different stories of people in different parts of um, their immigration journey. And our second part of the series will focus on um, the conditions in ICE detention 
and how that is then uh, exporting uh, the virus to countries like Guatemala, um, who are already struggling um, and their health systems can't really handle uh, these cases. So uh, to date, about 200, close to 200 Guatemalan deportees have tested positive for the coronavirus after returning. Um, and that's even after ICE uh, has implemented more, more measures uh, like testing, screening, and, uh, um, and has said that they, they would not send deported, um, they would not send detainees with the coronavirus. But, you know, as I said, that connects to the conditions in, in these detention centers because, you know, when you're talking about a, a cell that fits up to 75 people and I says that they've reduced that population, you're still not looking at uh, good conditions there that, that allow people to social distance. And what we've, what we've heard from people in detention is that they just feel, they feel very vulnerable. They feel like they don't have the conditions or the resources to be able to protect themselves. They feel like officials are not um, taking care of them. And there's also um, a mental health toll of, of what's been happening and, and the feeling that they don't have information about, about what's happening. Many activists told us that they receive a lot of calls and the calls are very frantic and, and sometimes um, the deportees are just you know, responding to the lack of, of information that they have. Like they may see that someone from their cell is taken out and they don't know if that person is going to a hospital. They don't know if that person is being released. And so there's just, um, you know, uh, it's a, a mental health toll that's also um, being inflicted on, on these people because of, of the, the conditions there. And um, to date, uh, ICE has confirmed, they've only confirmed three uh, deaths of, of detainees in their, in their custody. Um, I do wanna mention that because um, we have been in touch with one organization that is working with one of the families and um, they've shared um, a, a, a link with us of how people can help out that family. So I wanted to share that because I know many times readers you know, ask us what, what they can do. And, and sometimes it's, it, there's not always an easy answer to that, but sometimes there is. So I do want to mention that so that we can share that with, with anyone who's listening. But I would say in general, what we're, what we're hearing is that people feel vulnerable. They feel like they can't protect themselves. And that is uh, across the board, whether they're deported to Guatemala, whether they're in ICE detention, whether they're in MPP. And I just want to say that, you know, that's not a coincidence. That is a direct result of intentional policies that have been uh, carried out for years, decades, and across multiple uh, administrations. So it's, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's an intentional decision by, by leaders and policymakers. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Kat. I, I wanted to, to pick up on, on broadly on this issue of deportations. Um, because Maria Inez Zamudio's reporting last summer even for WBEZ focused on deported soldiers, uh, some of whom were legal permanent residents, some who had tried to become citizens. And Maria, it was in your reporting, you mentioned that those deportations of the non-citizen veterans were really an unintended consequence of a, a law back from 1996. So, um, walk us through some of their stories and then also some of the challenges you encountered even just trying to get access to public records on this information um, and then we can go on from there thank you so much for having me i'm so grateful for your support of my work so i want to start off with some comments uh, from some of the other panelists around the mpp program and i wouldn't i wanted to put it in context because it this matters the Trump administration has fundamentally changed the way that we adjudicate asylum cases. And that's important because when the system was created, it was created in a way that um, people could come in here and claim asylum, you know, have an interview at the port of entry, and then continue with their cases in a, in a more lax way. This idea that you have to wait for your turn 
in a third country is something that Trump introduced, is something that Trump talked about during the campaign trail, and it is something that he made sure it happened. I was in Matamoros multiple times last year and then earlier this year with uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And what, what we're seeing is really people essentially living in makeshift communities right across the, the border from uh, the Brownsville um, port of entry. And that's creating a lot of issues. They don't have running water. When I was there in, in January, parents were so upset that their kids were getting sick because they're literally living in a tent outside with no running water, no actual, um, you know, bathrooms, um, no medical attention at all. There was an, a small NGO there, but the parents were sending their kids alone. They were making the decision to send their kids alone. And none of them knew that COVID-19 was going to hit this badly. And so now you know, the parents thought that they were making a better decision for their kids instead of having them live in squalor. They sent them to, um, you know, across the border and um, they're having to live with these, you know, real consequences. But, you know, when I talked to them, they were like, you know, what, what would you do if you don't have money to feed your kid, if they're getting sick, skin rashes, an array of illnesses because they're living in these poor conditions? Like, why wouldn't you want to send them to the U.S., like the promised land, um, a place where they feel they might be safe? Uh, so I wanted to highlight that. And, and, and I think that it is really important to write and showcase stories about immigrants, but it's also very, very important to showcase the policy because these policies really have a huge impact. And a lot of times, uh, I'm attracted to these stories about policy because there are so many unintended consequences. And I've written many stories about how that kind of happens in immigration law. So, um, you know, going back to the Deported Veterans Project, I started learning about this project um, back in 2017 when I came across um, this Chicago veteran who was at the time in detention center fighting his deportation. Um, and I started talking to him over the phone and stayed in touch with him. I did a story for Latino USA um, and about his sort of, you know, his struggle coming back from war. He was one of the first um, uh, troops to go into Afghanistan after 9-11 and had a TBI and uh, severe PTSD. And at that time, if you remember when soldiers were coming back, there wasn't really a whole lot of awareness around PTSD and some of these other illnesses. Um, and so he started self-medicating, got involved with, um, you know, some drug dealers um, that were supplying his habit and, and then ended up in prison. He served um, his term in state prison and then was later placed in a removal proceedings. And, and that's where the policy really comes into play. In 1996, there was, um, a lot of enthusiasm around wanting to enforce strong, stricter immigration laws so that um, criminals wouldn't get into our country or people who had been um, convicted of a felony would leave the country. And so the way that we describe a felony in state court, for example, is very, very different than the way that immigration law describes what that felony is. So that's an, an important point to make, uh, and, and I'll, I'll explain why later. So now you have all these veterans who are coming back into the country um, who are supposed to get expedited citizenship, but most of the times that doesn't happen because of logistical difficulties, right? So Miguel, for example, was, was in Afghanistan in a war zone. He wasn't thinking about becoming a citizen. He comes back, gets in trouble, um, and because of that felony, you, now you're subject for deportation. And so I did, I, I did a story about him his failed attempts to try to stay into the, in the country. And when he was deported, um, him and I started communicating very regularly. And he invited me to go visit him. And that's when I reached out to, um, to your organization for funding. During that year in between me going to visit him and um, the original story or a year and a half, I had been filing a number of freedom of information requests with the federal government, trying to answer a very simple question. How many veterans have been deported in the country? And after many 
FOIA denials and some data that didn't answer that question, I got a tip from a source telling me that um, there was going to be a, um, a government accountability office report that was going to be published um, over the summer, so last summer. And so that's when I was like, you know what, that is my entry point to try to like figure out exactly how many veterans um, were deported, but let me try to get the stories. And so that's when I traveled to Tijuana where Miguel was living at the time. And really he became my source. Uh, he became sort of like a fixer because he just knew everyone in that community. And I just started interviewing dozens of veterans. Um, and, and then he connected me with other veterans who were living in you know, India and um, the Philippines and, and just other places. Um, now, this government accountability report revealed that at the very least, 92 veterans had been deported between 2018 and 2000, and, um, I'm sorry, 2013 and 2000, 2018. And what was most importantly um, uh, from this report is that the organization found that ICE did not consistently follow its own policies involving veterans who were placed in removal proceedings. And so rather than like dealing with a case by case basis and figuring out like who do we want to pursue and not close the case administratively, they didn't even identify who was a veteran and who wasn't. And so once you're in the system, um, the immigration court system, it can be really difficult because there's very few avenues for people to stay. There's cancellation of removal that can take, you know, it, it, it's difficult and it, uh, it can be granted according to each judge. So it just became really difficult. And, um, and so the thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands is that it is really difficult to cover immigration because of the lack of transparency. Unlike someone who gets arrested in Chicago, for example, I can go and pull the arrest report, I can pull the charging document, I can go to court, I can follow the case throughout. In immigration, and within the immigration context, we don't have that. There is a charging document, the notice to appear that we don't have access to. And when I've tried to get access to that, for example, I have to have the immigrants sign a waiver, then file a FOIA and wait between six to eight months, if not more, to get this information. And when it comes to, you know, reporting on detention centers, it's the same issue that you don't really have a whole lot of um, access to, to understanding what's going on in these cases, right? And so I think that that is the thing that we have to be really careful um, and we have to demand more transparency because it matters when we're trying to figure out exactly what is happening. This administration has shifted policy so much that it is important for us to try and keep tabs on every single policy change because what they're doing is that they're tr trying to restrict and rewrite immigration policy through these like small memos and these small things like MPP like the new DACA memo, for example. So we have to be really careful and we have to be uh, really diligent in trying to cover these issues. And Maria, you were talking about just this, well, one, uh, transparency issues. And if any, this is open to any of you, uh, in terms of um, not only the individual efforts of journalists and other advocates, but are there efforts at a legal level, uh, suits being filed that you're aware of to, to raise up, um, to create more transparency in the immigration arena, in the, with the uh, courts and so forth? I leave it open to any of you on that score to follow up on. If there is anybody who's doing it, please let me know because I think one of the central issues is that, um, for example, in, the last time I was in an immigrant detention facility was, I think, 2015, when we were reporting on Jose de Jesus, who committed suicide by swallowing his sock mm. while he was under suicide uh, watch. Um, but, you know, I am I know I'm banned. I don't know if it exists anywhere in writing. Um, and if it's a private, privately run uh, detention facility, will there even be a record that says, do not let this particular journalist in 
Um, and this has been very effective. And I, I think it is a tool, again, on a larger scale that we as journalists in the United States of America, where the question is, is there freedom of the press? Not that there is, but is there? And what do we do in order to assure it? Because in the same way that another hugely important population, which is the prison population, um, I mean, it's brilliant. You just, you just deny access, deny, 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 deny. You bring in private industry and therefore they can deny. And <clears throat> the story goes away. And the, net, and the framing of that narrative then is everything that we're trying to deconstruct, right? The framing is that these are criminals, the way that Donald Trump started his campaign, Mexicans, immigrants, all criminals, all bad. And now we have to do the work of, as Maria said, we have to deconstruct the policy. Um, so I do have a good question when I get my interview with Joe Biden. A girl can dream, I'm still hoping. And the question will be inspired by Maria's work, which is, will you at least commit to bringing back all of the deported veterans? I want to know, will he, as, how soon? Maybe that's not. But what will be the, 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 the procedures in which he begins to reunite families? And begin, how? I mean, that's going to be a big bit, you know what's going to happen is that they'll start a business to do that, right? I mean, this is the United States of America, capitalism, you know, assuming that, that if Joe Biden wins and if there is a transition in, in a democracy, if, 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 the problem is, is that immigrants right now and refugees, the most vulnerable, are at the back of the line. If it wasn't for this kind of reporting that is just kind of relentless and consistent, you know, all the time we're trying to do this, it would be a story that's in a black hole. Um, and, and really, in many ways, it still is in a black hole. This work is so important because we're just scraping a little tiny way to see through. But how many times have editors that we propose stories to, which is why I formed my own company, right? So I didn't have to propose it to anybody. Um, but how many times were we told, oh, that's not a, an immigrant dying in detention? That's not a story. A, a child getting, you know, a refugee child not being allowed in, that's, that happens all the time. And so our work actually, and the work of the journalists who are watching this um, has increased tenfold, a hundredfold, because we're not just telling these stories. What we're actually doing, again, to point back to what my colleague Maria Inez Amulio said, is that this is a systematic deconstruction of policy. And again, everybody talks about 1996. Well, so far it's come up. Who was president in 1996? It was Bill Clinton. He ran on a very divisive anti-immigrant platform. Um, so we have to begin to see this did not just start. And so this work is, again, not just work about these lives, Josue, Zoe, Susie, all of the people. It's not about those lives. It's about returning policy that is supposed to be according to the narrative of this country. You know, we as journalists, we're like, we want to tell a story. And now basically we're having to hold this country accountable to the policies it says it was founded upon. And if I might add um, a few comments around that question, I think that what we've seen in the last four to five years is that activists, advocates, organizations are really going they're really, uh, they're effectively using the court system to challenge some of these policies. Mm -hmm. There is a legal challenge for MPP. We all know the legal challenge around DACA and how that continues to shift, right? Um, we've seen a number of legal challenges, even during COVID-19. Um, I want to say like in April, I did a lot of reporting around how local groups in Chicago and Illinois were using the court system to try to get immigrants out of detention, which is something that they had tried to do previously. Um, and so, so they've been really effective in using the court system to try and, and focus on some policy in some cases. I think that what is missing in terms of granting more access to journalists and more transparency around the, the, the issue is that 
more news organizations are going to have to file more lawsuits challenging the, the delays and FOIA requests. I mean, we are talking about not getting records for over a year. I have FOIAs pending from years ago. And without that basic information, we don't understand what is truly going on within the system. I did a story back when uh, Obama was in, in office talking about how he was using all of these categories of deportations that were bypassing the court system to increase his numbers, right? We, we all know the, the term that activists use for Obama, the deporter in chief, right? He just, all of the systems that he created during his administration are now being used with the Trump administration. So I think that the challenge for us in trying to get more transparency from these systems is really going to come from lawsuits, I think. Um, and, and, and agencies being forced to disclose this information. We often see press releases from ICE stating that they've, you know, they've arrested 12 people and they give you descriptions for three people. They were, you know, they were convicted of X, Y, and Z for three people, but then the rest of the folks, we don't know anything about them. They're collateral arrests. And we literally cannot get any information at any of them there has been people who reach out to me trying to figure out what happened to their loved one. Someone is arrested by ICE and then they get transported and moved around facilities so often that many times they don't even know where they're at. You know, so it's, it's really difficult for families and it's also just important for us as journalists to have that access. But I don't think that is going to happen organically. It has to be, I believe it has to come from litigation from us really challenging the fact that they're giving us, you know, a year, two years, or they're basically saying, we are not going to give you this information because we don't have it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the excuse I got when I got all the denials around the simple question, how many veterans have you deported? They couldn't answer that. Not the court system, which tracks who gets deported, who doesn't get deported, not DHS. So, you know, I, I do think that it has to be, it has to be something that we're all actively doing, that journalists cover DHS, ICE, Border Patrol, the same way that we cover local law enforcement agencies. And I think part of the problem is that we don't see a lot of, you know, a lot of reporters uh, dedicated to covering immigration. We see, we see them in, at the New York Times level, we see them at NPR level, but we really need more. We need more people to start digging into these agencies because that creates more transparency. Have you found, uh, and again, this is open to all in terms of that, that issue of having more journalists pushing at these issues from, if we're talking about starting early at workshops to encourage journalism students to, to, to go into this avenue of reporting, um, what do you think journalists, the journalism community, uh, broadly speaking, or individual journalists can do to shore up journalists who are uh, emerging, you know, who are just getting into the field or urging them to, to move on on that score? Look, I'll just say very quickly that, um, you know, I'm Mexican, so I never say no to work. So anytime anybody offers me a job, I'm like, okay, yes. And so when I was asked to become a professor, I was like, okay, yes. So I just added that onto the other 16 jobs that I do. But it is actually one of the, now I'm the first uh, journalist in residence at Barnard College, my alma mater. And I, I have several students who are hoping to go into the world of journalism. And so what I do is I explain to them that this is not, it cannot be a passing fancy. Um, this is hard. And so I'm very clear with them that it's about a mission. That does not mean any of us here are activists. I don't like that term because to be an activist actually takes a tremendous amount of training and you have to do a lot to be an activist. And I'm not an activist, but, um, but I do tell my students what it's gonna look like because I need them to understand. But I also tell them you know, the behind the scenes, but also what happens and the fact that they are then touched by the journalism that we do, right? Um, and I think the other thing that we have to do is that if we have to continue to talk about our profession, 
Um, I'm forgetting the numbers right now, but basically, let me think if it was, okay, let me try more or less. These are going to be some rough numbers. Um, we used to have about the same amount of journalists and miners, i.e. miners who go down in the mine and mine, <laughs> not miners, miners who are actually mining for whatever. And, and now actually our numbers, there are fewer journalists in the United States than there are miners. Um, going into the mines. And, and we know that that's an industry that has shrunk. So there are like working journalists, uh, professional, less than 100,000 in the United States. <laughs> we need a lot of journalists. And I love what Maria is saying, which is, and let's get on it. You know, let's, let's get on. So we need lawyers. We need lawyers. We need lawyers who are going to then push this in those avenues while we continue to do the work of humanizing. Because ultimately, Everything that we're talking about is based on the consistent dehumanization of these people. And so when we as journalists, uh, and you know, I was one of the first, you know, who was saying, do not use the term illegal. Do not use the term illegal. These are not illegal immigrants. There's no such thing as an illegal immigrant. Do not use the term. And you got pushed back and we were criticized for having a political agenda. This is the consequence of that. And as you know, I've told this story and I'll just leave it with this. I mean, I didn't learn that from a radical Latino or Latina studies pro professor in the 1980s in the United States. I learned that from Elie Wiesel who survived the Holocaust. And he was the first one who said that the first thing the Nazis did was to declare the Jews to be an illegal people and gay people to be an illegal people. So this is not new. And the fact that it's been repeated again, honestly, is um, it's prescient for all of us. So everything we can do to convince other young people to get into the business, to start your own thing like I did, it's terrifying to run your own thing. It's terrifying all the time. But hell, we're all scared all the time. And if, if I may add something, uh, because I've benefited from the fact that Maria has her own company. I have enjoyed working with you so much and you've created such a great platform. I think that when we are thinking about the kinds of stories that we want to see, I tend to focus more on policy stories rather than identity stories. I am on a team that focuses on issues of race and class in Chicago, one of the most segregated cities in the country. But we do it from the lens of policy because we know that there's a lot of people writing about identity and that's great. But I think that we need to go further than that because we need to really explore how systems work and whether they're doing the thing that they were supposed to be doing. And we're identifying things that aren't working and we're quantifying it and we're identifying why that is a problem. And I think that's what we really need. And so what, I'm, what I've been doing and what I would suggest um, younger journalists do is that you understand which agencies are at play right? Because that is a first thing that it, a lot of times immigration is really difficult and is very reactionary. There's a campaign to, to keep one person in, in Chicago, for example, then everybody's covering that story. But I think we need to take a step back and really understand like which agency is responsible for what? What are they doing? How are they changing these policies? Um, little things that we don't even think is a big deal, for example, and this is a story I did not get to because I was so busy uh, back in, in the spring, but USCIS did not have any um, citizenship uh, ceremony. So this is the oath that you take right before you get your certificate and all of that. Uh, they did not do any Zoom ones. They didn't do any, one, any of them in person. And, and this is why it matters. It matters because until you get that certificate, you are not a citizen. Meaning if you get arrested and convicted of a felony, you, you're done. Um, the other thing that is important to note is that there's a lot of people who are legal permanent residents that are waiting for their um, citizenship um, ceremony so that they can go up in the list when they're claiming a family member to stay in the country legally. So it may not be like a big deal to us, but it is, it is absolutely a big deal to the people that are living it, right? Because a delay like that could add years to, to someone's um, adjustment of status. So I would really want people to, or young reporters, to really think about the kind of journalism they want to do. And I would really encourage them to, to start digging into investigative journalism. 
map out the things that you want figure out if there's other agencies that have those documents. I mean, I do that all the time. Like I file my FOIAs at the federal level knowing that I'm not probably not gonna get anything, but then I start at the local level, like trying to figure out like, well, how, do, how can I piece, piece uh, this story together? And I would really want reporters to really like start learning those skills. Um, the Ida B. Wells Society offers incredible training. Uh, uh, Ron Nixon started that with Nicole Hannah Jones. So I would really ask them to look for those resources to learn how to do this work because it is not easy. Uh, it is stressful. You end up absorbing a lot of the trauma that these, that these immigrants are sharing with you, for example. Like I remember spending an entire day or two with Miguel uh, in Tijuana as we were doing this story and it was heavy. I mean, he was describing what he was feeling and how he was almost going to die by suicide, uh, by a miracle, he didn't die. And so you carry a lot of that stuff. That's why it's important to do stories with those elements so that you can create change. Miguel was pardoned by the governor last summer and he was able to take his citizenship exam. So now he's here and he's now an activist. So I think that we need to start thinking about stories in those ways. Yes, it is about humanizing, absolutely. But it is also about making sure that the truth is out there and making sure that we are treating people with justice. Thank you, thank you so much. I had not even uh, been aware of that part about the, the citizenship ceremonies, which again, as you say, getting that information out there. Um, you know, we've talked about access uh, whether it's access to, to documentation, access to detention uh, facilities and individuals. So Hester from our audience um, is asking a couple of follow-on questions and maybe Anna Kat, you can start with a little bit from your this recent reporting is even a basic line, who is allowed into if a detention center to interview journalists, lawyers, translators, who gets a human rights activist? Who gets access? A second part of that, can someone volunteer to be a translator? Or does it have to be a, a professional translator with certification? So two part, who is allowed in? Just to, again, get everyone a little bit more clear on that. Um, and then if someone wants to assist in translation. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'll just start off uh, by talking about our experience. From my experience, I know it's very difficult to actually get into uh, the detention center as a journalist. So for this project in particular, we've been in touch with a few activist groups in Texas, um, and they've been in touch with uh, families and with detainees. And so I think that usually their process is that um, Oftentimes, family members reach out to them. Um, for example, in the case of, of Santiago, who was one of the three uh, immigrant detainees who died in, in US custody, he, his family reached out to a group um, and to, to ask for some assistance from them. And so they've been, they've been assisting them. And then sometimes those groups um, help make that connection. So the, the contact that I've had with detainees has been by the phone. Um, they can call you. Uh, it can be a little bit complicated to get, you know, get their numbers and, and have them call you. And, and that's quite difficult because as well, um, all of those calls are recorded. So there's a lot of concerns there in terms of, of them being able to speak freely. So that's how I've done it. Um, you know, since I'm based in Central America, usually um, a lot of the testimonies that I'm getting about, um, about detention, not just for this project, but in general, are coming from people who have recently been deported, um, who feel a little bit more comfortable talking about that experience afterwards. So that's one way to do it as well, but it, it is very difficult and, and maybe um, the other panelists have, have more to add about how they've done it as well. So it's, it's very difficult. I will just sort of cover the basics. Um, immigration court is open to the public. You do have to get some permission, however, for some hearings, for example, asylum, 
uh, claims are not open to the public. You have to be invited or have permission from the immigrant, but anyone can go. And I would encourage everyone to go to um, a docket hearing so that you see just the speed of how this moves. Um, there are many people who are not even, they don't even make it to the court uh, room. They do these like, tele like televised um, hearings. And so I would highly encourage everyone to go and see it for themselves because I think it's, it's something that everyone should see. Um, in terms of uh, detention centers, it's very rare that journalists get access to it. I ended up getting access to one in central, uh, one detention center in central Illinois, mostly because uh, one of the local representatives um, surprised the sheriff and we were escorted and given a little tour. But even that, like we didn't get a chance to talk to anybody. Um, I've done a lot of uh, calling people or talking to people from detention centers, but it's very, very, very expensive. Um, you get 15 minutes that uh, goes by very, very quickly, and then you get charged to reconnect again. So that is a challenge as well in terms of getting basic information coming out of these um, detention centers. So we, we, and I rely heavily on litigation from local groups, uh, from activists, from people who have been detained. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very secretive process and it, it is not great. Um, the place where people are being deported in Matamoros right across the street, uh, right across the bridge from uh, Brownsville, they're deporting people right into the place where a lot of the MPP folks are living. So um, asylum seekers. Um, and that matters because there's so many people in detention who have COVID-19. So you're basically releasing all of these folks who have COVID-19 possibly, and you're releasing them in a space where like the people who are living there have no access to water and they have very few resources. They rely on organizations feeding them or giving them um, resources. So it, it can be really difficult trying to get a clear answer as far as whether these uh, detention centers are doing a good job. Maria, do you have, uh, we're almost out of time, I should say. I know this I is walking, I was, quickly. I'm going to send a note to this thing. Please, everybody pre-order my book. We did put a, a note in the chat and we'll also add it to the, to the resource. It comes out September 15th and it's not so much about, well, well, yes, it's about numbers and dollars and books and we have to sell them. So I'm begging you, please, please <laughs> pre-order the book. But it's that this is my story of being a journalist, of being a woman, of being a rape survivor, of being a Mexican, of being all of these things that we've lived through. Um, and in, in the book, I talk about the experience of covering journalism. So the first immigrant detention facility that I saw was in 1986 with Scott Simon in Harlingen, Texas. We won an award for that piece because no one had ever, it was like, what are these places? And it's exactly where they were holding people from Nicaragua and El Salvador and Guatemala. And they were in the low hundreds, but they used to call it El Coralón, which means the corral, because there they were just outside in the hot burning sun with orange jumpsuits. So there was not even an, a, a structure to put them in. That's how little they mattered. So I just want to say thank you to um, and I got you know, for being a young journalist who has made a decision to go and see with your own eyes and to Maria Inez for consistently saying it's about policy, policy, policy. And then, you know, the work that I try to do, which is kind of melding that with the humanity. And I just really want to say again, thank you to Pulitzer. Um, and for all of the journalists who are watching this, we need you desperately. We can't give up. Well, thank you so much. This is, uh, as I said, this hour has gone by quickly. Um, and I know that we didn't get to all the questions from the audience and the conversation amongst all of you, but I really am so grateful and thankful to Maria Inez, Maria Inez, uh, Maria and Anna Kat uh, for joining us today. And of course, thank you to our audience. Um, we'll, we'll, as we had mentioned, this is a recorded video session that we'll put the up on our site and also have links for further information. Uh, we want to thank also our colleagues as well at the Pulitzer Center, especially Holly Pippenberg, who's our producer for this session today. 
and uh, just want to thank her as well for keeping us on track. Uh, the Pulitzer Center centers reporting and education outreach on mass incarceration as well as related justice issues is supported by the Art for Justice Fund and other donors as well. And uh, please stay with us just for a few minutes longer because we ha do have a brief survey to pop up to, to get your thoughts on this conversation and what more we can do to share information. We appreciate you joining with us all today. And please remember we are a nonprofit journalism organization and so we depend on donor support further. Our next session in this Focus on Justice series will be our last one for this summer. Uh, but that's not to say we won't be continuing to focus on these issues in the reporting and in the public outreach. The next session is, Tuesday, is Thursday, August 6th at 2 p.m., where we'll be looking at issues of voter suppression in the U.S. So please join us next week when we speak with journalist Brittany Gibson, attorney Tori Wang Wenger, a Scanlon Fellow at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, and Dr. Brenda Williams, a community advocate working in Sumter, South Carolina. So again, please feel free to share this event information along uh, with others in your network. And thank you for being with us today. Thanks, our, thanks to our uh, speakers, and please have a good afternoon. <laughs>